Well, good morning. Hey, uh, be sure to, after the service, be sure to introduce yourself to our new worship minister. Uh, <laughs> looks a little different, doesn't he? <laughs> For those of you who may be new, we did not get a new worship minister. He just uh, looks a little different. He cut his hair quite a bit. And I, I thought it was really cool of him. He uh, was able to donate it to a program called Curls for Clergy. And so... <laughs> It was really great of him to do that. So. <laughs> You're welcome, Blake. Hey, uh, even though I'm teasing him, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but that, that second song we sang, Oh, the Love, is actually a song that he wrote, and uh, it, it just went perfectly with this series, and hopefully you'll see that as we go through this sermon today, but uh, I thought it was just a great fitting song for this series. Uh, when, I, uh, when I graduated college, my first full-time ministry was at a church in Pataskal, a Tri-Village Christian church. I was doing youth ministry there, and uh, one of the members of our church had passed away, and he happened to be the chief of police for Pickerington. And so uh, I went to, went to go to the funeral, and since it was going to be such a large uh, funeral because of who he was, they were having it at a church, a larger church in Pickerington. And so I got to the funeral like just, just before it was starting and walked into this big, huge auditorium, and uh, it was just packed. And there were like three sections of seating. There was a middle section and then two side sections. And so I just looked for the first available seat that I could find. It happened to be on the right side as you're looking at the stage. <clears throat> so I slipped in, again, it's packed in there, sat in my seat. Well, at the end of the funeral, since the, the funeral was for the police chief, they had all of those who were in law enforcement, the funeral asked all, all those who were in law enforcement to go ahead and stand and then exit. And I kid you not, every single person in my section, there were like 150 to 200 people, stood up, <laughs> walked out, Except for me. <laughs> I sat there all alone. And then the funeral director dismissed the middle section and then the other section. And I sat in this big room all by myself. <laughs> and I became keenly aware that day that I am not a police officer. Not one bit. <laughs> Well, today I want to talk about this idea of awareness, this idea of awareness. But I'm not talking about self-awareness, because I certainly lacked it that day. Uh, I'm talking about awareness of one. Last week we started this series, and really it's a series that, that we're using as a theme for this year. And if you missed the sermon last week, I want to uh, challenge you to go back and listen to it, encourage you to go back and listen to it, because it really sets the stage for what we're doing. But this series, we're calling it Pray for One. And what we're doing is we're asking each of you, all of us, including myself, to every day start your day with this simple prayer. God, please give me one person to share your love with today. God, please give me one person to share your love with today. If you didn't get one of these handouts, we, we gave these out last week that are, they're at our beginning point table in the lobby. We would love for you to take one of these with our prayer on it, this pray for one prayer, and put it in a place where you're going to see it every day when you, when you get up or whatever. Uh, I took a picture of where I put mine at my house so you can see that I'm participating in this. Go ahead and show that picture. So, so mine is in my bathroom where I'll get out of the shower and put on my wig and put on my... No. <laughs> and I'll be able to see it. You can take that down now. That's awkward. Um, <laughs> but last week we said that this, this prayer that we're praying uh, is, is intended to help us be aligned with each other, kind of a common goal and mission. But more importantly, this prayer, we're using this to, to be aligned with God and his purpose and plan for this world. We said that this pray for one prayer really puts us smack dab at the intersection of the Great Commission to go and make disciples of all nations and the greatest commands to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. This week we want to talk about how this pray for one prayer will help us to have an awareness like Jesus has for the one. So today we're going to be spending our time in Luke chapter 15. If you have a Bible or a Bible app, go ahead and open to Luke 15. And in this chapter of the Bible, Jesus tells three consecutive parables. So a parable is what we say is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So it's a story that has a deeper meaning. So he's going to tell three consecutive parables that reveal his awareness 
his concern, his love for the one. Here's the context, though, for why Jesus tells these stories. Luke 15, starting in verse 1, he says, or Luke says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. If you were here three weeks ago, we actually talked about these tax collectors and sinners. In Jesus' day, tax collectors were like the worst of the worst. Uh, They were mainly Jewish men who had purchased from Roman officials the right, the privilege, to collect various taxes, customs, and tolls. And this whole system was just littered with abuses. These tax collectors were known for cheating the people, for being dishonest, and for being unpatriotic because they were doing this to their own people, to fellow Jews. And so pious Jews, these religious Jews, believed that their occupation made them ritually unclean. So they were viewed as being alienated from God, these tax collectors were. But not only was, were, were tax collectors welcomed by Jesus and sharing a meal with him, but then Luke tells us that there were uh, another group of people that were there. Then they fall into this category they called sinners. Yes, we are all sinners. If you didn't know that, we are. But this, in Jesus' day, was a classification of its own. It was, this term sinners was used to to talk about people who were marked by clearly immoral lives or occupations, people that no respectable Jew would have anything to do with. And then lumped into this category of sinners were also people with certain diseases or disabilities. They were considered sinners because these religious Jews believed that obviously they must have committed some great sin to be cursed in this way. So these tax collectors and these sinners would not have been welcomed in the temple and yet Jesus came along and outcasts just flocked to him. And he actually welcomed them. He actually loved them. And he would spend time with them. He would eat with them. And this irritated the religious leaders of their day. They didn't didn't have to give any reason for their displeasure. All they had to do was state the obvious fact. And the guilt was plain. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And that's all they had to say. Guilty. Case closed. You know, what's interesting is this word for welcomes, where Jesus welcomes sinners, is the Greek word prosdekomai, and it's used six other times in the Gospel of Luke, and every time it means eagerly await or expect and look for. So the word welcomes seems so passive. Oh, Jesus welcomes tax collectors and sinners. But this is not a passive term. Jesus is not passive. He is eagerly awaiting. He is seeking and expectantly looking for sinners and tax gatherers to come to him and to eat with him. And so for the rest of Luke chapter 15, we read of Jesus' response to these accusations that he eagerly looks for sinners and tax collectors. And he responds with three consecutive parables, starting in verse 3. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. Now in that day, a normal sized flock was a hundred sheep and each night the shepherd would take count. And in this parable, the shepherd discovers on his nightly count that one is missing. And Jesus says that the shepherd leaves the 99 to pursue the one lost sheep. When he finds it, he calls his friends and neighbors together and he celebrates. And then Jesus brings home his point because remember, this is, this is a story that has a deeper meaning to it. He says, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Now, when Jesus talks about 99 righteous people who do not need to repent, he's not talking about perfect people. Everyone needs to repent. What he's referring to in front of these Pharisees and teachers of the law is people who seem to have no obvious public or culturally disgusting sins to repent of. These are righteous persons. These are at least, they're they're sins that aren't easily witnessed. Again, everyone is sinful and needs to repent. But his point is, Jesus is interested in pursuing and finding the one who is lost. 
Then he continues with another story. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins. Some translations say 10 drachmas. A drachma was a day's wage. Suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. And so we have a very, very similar story. A woman has 10 coins, and the implication is that this is all she had, and she loses one. And I kind of picture her running around her house, frantically cleaning, sweeping it up, trying to find this coin, kind of like when uh, parents leave a teenager at home and they say, hey, when we get back, I want you to clean the house. And then the teenagers are watching Life 360 and see that the parents are like one mile from home. They frantically go about cleaning the house, right? They go at it. And so she is cleaning in turbo mode, whatever, sweeping up. And when the woman finds the coin, Just like the parable of the lost sheep, she calls her friends and her neighbors together and they celebrate. And once again, Jesus brings home the deeper point. He says, in the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So Jesus has now set the stage for an even longer parable that will not only reemphasize the joy of finding the one that is lost, but it's also going to give something else for the Pharisees and the teachers of the law to consider. Jesus continued, there's a man who had two sons. The one, the younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. So he runs away with the inheritance, right? When I was a little kid, there would be times where I would get really angry, my parents upset because I wasn't getting what I wanted or I wasn't allowed to do something that I wanted to do. And so I had this like little play briefcase. It was like this little plastic thing. And I would get mad at my parents and I would stuff that little briefcase full of some of my things, close it up, and I'd take it and I'd swing it in in my hand and I'd tell my parents, I'm going to go run away. And I was like 30 at the time, so they were thrilled at this, but... (laughs) I was like five, right? Well, uh, when I told my parents I wanted to run away, I was telling them I wasn't happy because I wasn't getting what I wanted. But in this parable, when the son asked for his share of the inheritance, his share of the estate, yes, he is indicating he doesn't want to live under his father's rules anymore, but it's more than that. He's also essentially saying, Dad, I wish you were dead. I mean, you don't typically get an inheritance, until someone dies, right? And I cannot imagine one of my daughters saying to me, Dad, give me my share of the inheritance. I mean, it'd be laughable. I'd be like, okay, here's $4.23, right? <laughs> but imagine saying that in a culture where the father could, could have legally had his son beaten for saying such a thing. The son is obviously immoral, rude, selfish. He's become so obsessed with what he wants and when he wants it that he treats his own father with such utter disrespect. And it's obvious that this request started off as something that came out of selfishness. The younger son probably didn't intend to break his father's heart. He probably never meant to destroy his relationship with his family. But what started as selfish ambition to make his own way without anyone having to look over his shoulder, it ended up costing him more than he could ever have imagined. So in this parable, the father gives his younger son his share of the inheritance, and soon after, the son sets off to a distant country. In the story, the distant country is literally a far, far away place, but figuratively, The reality of the distant country is that it's not just some random far away place, but it is a distant country. It is a distant place because it is a place outside of the father's house. There are many of you who probably remember what it was like to live in the distant country. Now, you may not have gone somewhere far, far away, or maybe you did, but you were distant because you were distant from the heavenly father. There are some of you You're there right now. Like, you don't even know why you came to church today. We're glad you're here, and maybe there's a reason you're here today, but but you're living in a distant country. And there are some of you living in a distant country, maybe, that don't even realize 
You are living far from the Heavenly Father. You're living in a distant country. The younger son set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. And verse 14 says, after he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. So once the son had spent all of this money that he had demanded from his father, the worst thing happens, a famine. There's no rain, there's no food, there's no money to be found anywhere. Or to quote from the Academy Award-winning drama, Dumb and Dumber, we got no food, we got no jobs, our pet's heads are falling off. <laughs> Some of you are like, that didn't win an Academy Award for drama. No. And the son is absolutely broke at this point. The distant country seems like such a good place to be, but it'll leave you empty. In fact, the, the son was so broke, so empty, that as a last resort, he found a job, and it was a job feeding pigs. And we read in verse 16 that he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. And then we read this terribly depressing and sad line, but no one gave him anything. All those relational bridges had been burned, and no one was there to help him in his time of need. No one gave him anything so Jesus was telling this story to a Jewish audience about a Jewish boy in a Jewish culture. And if you understand this, pigs were considered unclean animals to Jews. So what Jesus is doing is he's making it crystal clear that this guy, this younger son, he is at rock bottom. He is at the lowest of lows. Not only is he feeding these unclean animals, animals he wouldn't have been permitted to eat, let alone handle, but he even longs to eat what these pigs are eating. He'd fallen so low and so hard. He'd become so insignificant that no one even gave him anything. It was an indication of total neglect. The distant country, which seemed like it would be so fun, so freeing, so exciting, may have started out that way. But it ended up leaving him broke and alone and it cost him everything. He's in the distant country. He's at rock bottom. And verse 17 says, when he came to his senses, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, I'm starving to death. I want to eat what the pigs are eating. I know what I'll do. I'll set out and I'll go back to my father and I'll say to my father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. I love that line where it says, when he came to his senses, you know, he's at rock bottom. And the only place left to look at that point is up. And he, he awakened to the consequences of his decisions. And he thought, you know what? If I leave the distant country, if I, if I head back to my father's house, if I tell him I'm sorry, if I beg for forgiveness, if I try to work hard and prove my worth and show him that I can do this, maybe, maybe he'll have some sort of mercy on me and he'll take me back. Not, not as a son, I wouldn't even dream for that, but as one of his hired servants. And then we read this incredibly brave line in verse 20. So he got up and he went to his father. Do you know how hard that is to do? How humbling it is to take that first step back to the father. Some of you, you know you are in the distant country. You are far from God, but you would rather stay with the pigs instead of take that, taking that humiliating first step back to the Father. It's a blow to pride. It's a blow to your ego. You thought you could do it on your own. I can't imagine how humiliated you might feel. But is it worth it? And I just imagine this son in the story, as he takes that first step to head back, he starts rehearsing in his mind this 
this plea that he wants to make to his father, this line, he says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And maybe he was preparing himself for the I told you so's. I told you if you'd go off. I told you if you'd do this, it would be like this. Why didn't you listen? Maybe he was preparing for total rejection, but he had to try something. So he got up and he went to the father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. And here we have this picture of the father who was waiting, watching, hoping for the son to make his way back. And it says that the father was filled with compassion for him and he ran to his son. He threw his arms around him and kissed him. And the son spouted out this rehearsed line, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But his speech fell on deaf ears from the father. The father didn't care about an apology. The father didn't need to hear a speech. The father didn't need to hear how his son had changed, how his son had come to his senses. The father didn't want his son to come work for him. The son was home. And that's all that mattered. That's all that he cared about. And hopefully this is obvious to you in this story that this father is a picture of our heavenly father. And did you know that this is the only time in scripture we have a picture of our heavenly father running? There's no other time in scripture where we see God running. And what is he running to? He's running to the one. He's running to his son. You have to understand this was not normal. In order for the father to run, he would have had to have hiked up his garment or else it would have dragged in the dirt. And for a father, a grown man to do that, especially for a son who had been so disrespectful to him, this would have been unheard of. This would have been complete indignity for the father. But he didn't care. The father ran to him. He throws off social customs and taboos and he runs to his son and he embraces his son. And no one listening to Jesus that day could have predicted this. No one would have expected this. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead. He's alive again. He was lost, but now he's found. And so they began to celebrate. So the son is given a robe, which would have been given to a guest of honor. He's given a ring, which signified authority. The son wasn't going to be a hired hand. He was an heir to what the father had. He was given sandals to wear, which was what a free man would wear, not a slave. And then they kill a fattened calf. This is a calf that was being saved for a special occasion. And they bring it out because this is a special occasion. We're going to have a feast and celebrate because this son of mine was dead and he is alive again. He was lost. And now he's found. And this seems to be the end of Jesus' answer to these accusations that he would dare welcome tax collectors and sinners and eat with them. Three times Jesus tells a story of celebration over finding what is lost. But those of you who know this story know that this is not the end of the story. Meanwhile, verse 25, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come home, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him home safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in, so his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, notice he won't even acknowledge that it's his brother, this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you, you kill the fattened calf for him. 
And notice he gives sharp criticism, not just to the younger brother, but to his father as well for doing such a, a thing like that. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found I want you to notice some things about the father in his treatment of this older son in this. First, we see that the father came out to him. He pursued the older son. He went outside the house to get to him. And then the father pleaded with him. He didn't scold him. He didn't berate him. He pleaded with him. The father called him my child, even though the son was trying to compare himself to a slave. He says, my child. He said, everything I have is yours. And then he said, and we had to. We had to celebrate. Literally, it was necessary to celebrate, indicating that the older brother should have been joining in on the celebration. Again, the context of these parables is that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were accusing Jesus of welcoming tax collectors and sinners and eating with them. And in this third parable, the tax collectors and the sinners would have been represented by who? The younger son, obviously, right? Yet the push to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law was made obvious in the father's speech to the older son. And the implication was, you know what? You should be joining in the celebration as Jesus eats and has an audience with tax collectors and sinners. Jesus is going to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and he's pleading with them and he's pleading with all of us, sinners of the worldly kind and sinners of the religious kind, to come to your senses, to come in from the distant country of misery apart from the Father's house and come back to the Father's house. This parable, it would have been shocking to Jesus' audience, but this whole story was a bit shocking. It was shocking that the younger son made such a selfish request. It was shocking that the father actually gave him his inheritance when he was asked. It was shocking that the younger brother would end up in a pig pen. It was shocking that the older brother never went out and searched for the younger brother. It was shocking that the father ran to his son. It was shocking that the father would throw such a big party for his son who had returned. Oftentimes we call this parable the parable of the what son? The prodigal son, right? Parable of the prodigal son. Do you know what that word prodigal means though? We use that word, but do we really know what that word means? It means wastefully or recklessly extravagant. Wastefully or recklessly extravagant. And that is a, a fitting term for this younger son, isn't it? He was a prodigal. He was wastefully, recklessly extravagant and squandering all of his inheritance in wild, immoral living. Certainly the younger son was a prodigal by definition. But you know what? By definition, couldn't we say that the father was a prodigal as well in the opposite way? At least in the world's eyes, what the father did seemed very wastefully or recklessly extravagant, didn't it? What would Jesus' listeners expect the father to do in this story? Shame the son? Have him stoned? Not accept him back? Maybe. Maybe take him back as a servant. And yet that's not what we see from the father. The father was such a prodigal. He was wastefully and recklessly extravagant. He was a prodigal in how he waited and he watched for his son to come home. He was a prodigal in how he ran out and embraced and kissed his pig-smelling broken son. He was a prodigal in how he elaborately gave his son a robe and sandals and a ring. He was a prodigal in how he restored his son, his boy, not to a servant or a slave, but back to being the, in a position of son as an heir. He was a prodigal in how he killed the fattened calf that he had been saving for a special occasion. He was a prodigal in how he threw a party. He was a prodigal in how he treated his stingy, ungracious older son. He was a prodigal in how he was wastefully and recklessly extravagant in his giving of grace. Jesus tells us this parable about a prodigal father who waits patiently, eagerly 
for us to return to him. Jesus tells about a prodigal father who would do anything to see us back in his house. Jesus tells about a prodigal father who would suffer unimaginably while he waits for his children to come home. And that's the kind of God that we have. He is a prodigal God. He will go to great lengths and spare no expense to get you back and to get others back. In this chapter of the Bible, in Luke 4, 15, there was one sheep out of a hundred. There was one coin out of ten. There was one son out of the two. God has a universe to run, galaxies to uphold, atomic particles to manage, governments to rule in his providence. But there's not much in the Bible that says that all of heaven rejoices over the orbits of the stars or all of heaven rejoices over the rise of kings and politicians and athletes. Jesus is clearly referring to something special in these parables. When one sinner repents, there is a special joy in heaven. God cares for individuals one at a time. God cares for individuals one at a time. And so the question that Jesus sought to answer was, what does it mean that Jesus is eating with tax collectors and sinners? But the question that Jesus leaves for the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and for the church and for individual Christians to ponder and answer is this. What does it mean that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law are not eating with them? What does it mean that they're grumbling about Jesus eating with them? So let's bring it back to this pray for one prayer. This prayer that we're asking you to do every day. God, please give me one person to share your love with today. We are asking that God would make us aware of the one because Jesus cares for the one. This is a prayer that is intended to break us away from our distracted lives, to break us away from our selfish lives, to break us away from our overly busy lives and to stop what we are doing and go after, to pursue after the one. Who is it that you need to be eating with? Will you join us in this endeavor? Will you join us? Will you join Jesus in this pursuit as we pray for one? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this chapter of the Bible is incredible. What it reveals about who you are. And God, we are so thankful that we were one that you cared about. That you have pursued us when we were in the distant country. For those of us who are your followers, God, we are thankful that it, there was celebration over our repentance, over our turning to you, over us getting up and going to the Father. We thank you that you ran to us with open arms. But God, that grace that has been lavished upon us, poured upon us, may we pour it out on others. God, will you make us aware of the people in our lives that we encounter each and every day that we can share your love with. God, please give us one person to share your love with today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So I told you I love that, that verse in verse 20 where, Jesus, where the, it was just such a bold and brave move that the younger son made said so he got up and went to the father and some of you you have been in the distant country and it's time to take that humbling first step it is a hard step I know but I think you'll be surprised by who is ready to welcome you home and so if you have a decision a step to make toward Jesus today during this next song, I'm just going to go in the back, uh, back of the room. And if you just need someone to talk to about that, 
or you just need some prayer, or as always, we have someone at beginning point after the service, but I'm going to be back there, um, and I'd love to help you take that difficult step if you need to.